showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome to Night Fright. Folks, before we begin the show tonight, I just want to issue a warning. If there's little ones around, you may want to send them off to bed. Uh, if you're inclined to be disturbed by graphic images and content, you may want to head to bed yourself. It's going to be a very heavy show tonight, much more so than usual. We're going to be discussing serial killers. You know, folks, I look out from the studio right across Lake Ontario, and tonight's a perfect night to discuss this subject matter. It is blowing. It is raining. We're in the midst of a huge storm. It's a wonderful night to settle in, sit back, relax, and watch Night Fright. Our guest tonight is none other than Dr. Michael Stone. You know that name and you've seen that face if you watch Discovery's Most Evil. Tonight we're going to be profiling, looking at three of Canada's biggest serial killers. Carla Homoka, Paul Bernardo, and Colonel Russell Williams. And I think I'll take that Colonel off at this point. Um, it would be insulting I, to continue to call him Colonel for the folks that are serving overseas right now. Where we broadcast out of Kingston now is a stone's throw from the penitentiary, the Kingston Penitentiary, where two of the three I just mentioned are housed. As I go by there almost on a daily basis, there's something very ominous. Um, I don't know if you could call it a feeling or whatever. When I pass by that building, whew, chills go up and down my spine. When I think of what are, what is behind the walls, I get even bigger chills. Settle in, get ready for an electric show. Uh, one like we've never had before. As I said, uh, Dr. Michael Stone is with us from Discovery Channel's Most Evil. It's going to be a show for the books, folks. Strap in and hang on. Here we go. There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, folks. Welcome. As I said at the outset of the show, if you've got little ones up right now watching, you may want to send them into another room, send them off to bed. Also, I want to warn you, if you are disturbed by graphic images and graphic content, you may want to head off to bed yourself or indeed channel to a different show. And I say that with all sincerity because we're going to be looking at serial killers tonight. Three of Canada's biggest serial killers, folks, and they are Paul Bernardo, Carla Homoka, of course, and Russell Williams. And our guest tonight is none other, and I'm sure you recognize his face from Discovery Channel's Most Evil, is none other than Dr. Michael Stone. I want to welcome you back to Night Fright, Dr. Stone. He's joining us, phone, folks, via Skype from New York City. How are you tonight, my friend? Very good, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Just let me read a little bit of your credentials here. He's Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. He is the author of 10 books, most recently Personality Disorders, Treatable and Untreatable. Uh, he's got over 200 professional articles and book chapters. Uh, he's been on... Um, Oh, just let me read this off. It's CNN, ABC News, CBS News, uh, NBC News, the New York... And, you know, if I spent more time reading this whole <laughs> this whole credentials, we wouldn't have a show. So we're going to jump to it right away. Sir, where were you when you first heard about our infamous Canadian 
Russell Williams. We're going to start off with him, and then we're, I guess we'll jump back and forth to Bernardo as well. Well, I think I was staring at the, at the computer, the internet, and the news came across uh, that this uh, erstwhile Canadian Air Force colonel uh, who had uh, sometimes uh, been honored with the uh, task of uh, ferrying uh, Queen Elizabeth from London uh, to Canada and so on, was now uh, arrested for uh, a couple uh, rape murders and for a long a spell, uh, going back uh, to around 2007, if not before, of uh, stealing lingerie from the homes of girls and young women. And furthermore, uh, taking, uh, which was unique, uh, taking pictures of himself doing these uh, murders and, and so on uh, as a, a cross-dressing uh, so that he would appear like a man-woman with brassiers and panties uh, at the same time that he was performing uh, these uh, monstrous acts. Now, sir, indeed you call them monstrous acts. You know, this begs a question. Um, how does a man with such inclinations rise to such a rank and such a prestige in a military situation you would think that there would be screening enough to go along with his rise to a colonel and of course he's right beside the queen the prime minister he's ferried around and all sorts of dignitaries to weed out someone like this what happened well first of all i don't think that there was much weeding that could be done because for a long time, until he was uh, perhaps in his late 30s, early 40s, uh, he wasn't known to have done these sorts of things. He may have done cross-dressing uh, in the privacy of his own home. Uh, I don't think that uh, people who, uh, men I should say, who cross-dress start doing so uh, at the age of 40. I think it's something uh, that goes back uh, oftentimes to childhood. Uh, but. Uh, we don't know that, but the point is, uh, nobody would know to ask him during his, let's say, initial interviews as he's being vetted, you know, for the Air Force, and by the way, uh, do you like to walk around in ladies' shoes and, and wear brassiers and panties? I mean, who the hell would ask that? So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, we're making course. fun, but yeah, I understand what you're saying, yeah. So, he, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't know to ask, and if they did, he would say, who me? So. Uh, it, w it would only be when he began to lose control, self-control, in the last few years uh, that uh, <clears throat> these sorts of habits would become known. So here was somebody who was different from the more typical serial killer who was really um, a very dis emotionally obviously disturbed kind of guy. Uh, he was not obviously emotionally disturbed. He was a very tight, meticulous, uh, rigid uh, obsessional, uh, self-controlled uh, military guy, but not somebody you know who was crazy. He was not blatantly psychopathic like Ted Bundy or some of the more uh, iconic ones, or, or Paul, Paul Bernardo for that matter. So he would uh, fly under the. He's a he's a in the Air Force. He would fly under the radar of uh, psychopathology and uh, criminal uh, behavior. Now. Uh, sir, I have a question to ask you, but first I want to tell folks who we're speaking with. Folks, uh, as I'm going to say repeatedly throughout this broadcast, if you're just joining us, you may want to send the younger folks to bed right now. We're going to be talking about serial killers tonight, graphic content. Uh, if you're disturbed by uh, both graphic images and content yourself, perhaps you want to skip this one show. Uh, we're speaking with Dr. Michael Stone, and if you recognize that face as I point to him, he is uh, the host of Discovery Channel's Most Evil. Um, he is a psychiatrist that has looked at serial killers for most of his life. He is uh, teaching psychiatry at Columbia University as well. His book is called Anatomy of Evil. Easy way to get it, as always, folks. Just go to the www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover associated with tonight's guest, and I'll take you right to a place where you can order it from the comfort of your own home. And tonight is a great night to settle in your armchair, your comfy armchair. Keep the light on for this show, folks. It is going to get creepy. Dr. Stone, I have a question to ask you. Was he a ticking time bomb? We're talking about Russell Williams, by the way, folks. Was he a ticking time bomb? And is it common for men 
and is it gender specific once they hit their 40s that these urges i don't know what else to call them are released uh, i don't think so i think uh in retrospect, I think we could make a case that he was a bit of a ticking time bomb. I'm assuming that, like most transvestite men, that uh, there could even be a, a genetic or hereditary component, something that would manifest itself in childhood. A lot of the uh, serial killers, well, uh, I, I've profiled a, a great many serial killers from true crime biographies, these thick books you get in the true crime section of your bookstore, uh, where there's a whole biography of, uh, rather than just a newspaper sketch or a magazine sketch, I've already looked at 164 serial killers. I've identified 10, including Colonel Williams, or Mr. Williams now, uh, who uh, are transvestites. Uh, but uh, many of them clearly began their careers as uh, cross-dressers when they were children, such as Jerry Brudos in Oregon, who uh, was scolded uh, viciously by his mom, for walking around in her shoes, and she shamed him for that, and so can on. I, so, can I interrupt you right there, sir? Is this, um, you know, there's a lot of transvestites around. Is this something that people should fear as perhaps a foundation for a perversion later on? And if a, if a mom or dad does come across their child dressing in the opposite gender's clothes, how should they respond to that? Should they encourage it, discourage it? What is the best uh, way to deal with something like that? Well, that's a difficult question. I don't think they should encourage it. I don't think there's much they can do to discourage it. They might want to uh, encourage the, the boy to get some kind of psychiatric help. Maybe uh, there, it's also tied into some emotional problems that could be uh, helped or rectified such that he would uh, have less of that tendency. But in the main, I think it's very difficult to really correct or uh, annihilate a perversion of that sort, uh, whichever it is, whether it be voyeurism or uh, exhibitionism, those, those are not easy to fix. So, uh, but it also is important to keep in mind that the uh, percentage of uh, transvestites, for example, who do violent acts is, I think, quite small. So that when you get somebody like Colonel Williams, who's made national, and if not international, headlines, for vicious crimes, rape and murder and prolonged torture of the women before the last two, before he killed them, uh, it, it sort of gives transvestites a bad name, so to speak, uh, whereas the, there's a great many uh, transvestites who go through their life and don't hurt anybody. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not something that is uh, clearly associated with violent crime. Is there cases where women actually dress up, sir, as men as well? Is, is it cross-gender that, in that respect? Or is it primarily men that dress as women? I think there are more men that dress as women than there are women that dress as men, although uh, in the 18th century there are a number of famous authoresses uh, who, because of the prejudice against women being known as authors, uh, uh, there would be a tendency for the women to dress as men, get recognized as men, uh, in order to uh, increase the likelihood that their works would be respected. So you have uh, people, either that or, or women like uh, George Sand, the Chopin's girlfriend, or, or Mademoiselle de Maupin, who uh, would dress as men or dress in very mannish clothes. Uh, but that was a, a cultural thing because of the difficulty women had of getting accepted uh, for doing intellectual things that were supposed to be uh, man's area. Folks, we're speaking with Dr. Michael Stone. You're going to recognize his face and that name, of course. Discovery Channel's Most Evil uh, Psychiatry. He's teaching psychiatry right now at Columbia University. He's joining us via Skype from New York City. We're discussing a very heavy subject tonight, folks. Serial killers. Uh, Paul Bernardo, Carla Homoka, as well as Russell Williams, who we're discussing right now. And um, you may want to send the kids off to bed for this one or channel it. Um, easy way to get tonight's information, as always, www.nightfrightshow.com, www.nightfrightshow.com. His book is called Anatomy of Evil. We'll be getting into some of that very shortly, folks. He's got 22 different levels that Mr. Stone has figured out. Uh, he calls them gradations of evil, and indeed they are. And we'll be getting to that, and we'll try and figure out 
where on that scale all three of the people I just mentioned reside, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book cover. As always, we'll take you right to a place online where you can order this book from the comfort of your own home. Sir, let's go back now to transvestites. Um, and I don't mean transvestites. I mean the perversion that uh, Russell Williams took it to. Is that genetic? Now, I, when I was doing research here, sir, I, I was reading some of your book and uh, some of the, uh, the studies that you've done, and you say there is a hereditary component. Now, is that genetic or is that behavior? Well, I think there's a genetic component in this sense. I think that uh, men who uh, are very fixedly cross-dressers mm -hmm. uh, have a, an ambiguous sexuality. In other words, as, as a matter of fact, some of the um, serial killers, the, the ten serial killers that I have um, studied, their biographies, who were cross-dressers, uh, several, of the, about th three or four of them were uh, openly gay, one was bisexual. Uh, so, uh, there, and, as, and as what we're beginning to learn in the last ten years is that uh, transvestism and, more, and particularly pedophilia, now here's another thing, and I'll get to that in a minute more, but half of the ten serial killers that I have tracked who are tra cross-dressers also are pedophiles. And Russell Williams also, uh, don't forget, uh, went after girls and, and so on. So he was, has the pedophilia and he was also uh, found to have a kitty porn on his computer, which is the one thing that he was deeply ashamed of. Uh, so uh, we know now, which we didn't know before, from studies of functional magnetic res resonance imaging, fMRI, that there are peculiarities in the emotional part of the brain, the so-called limbic system, and the frontal lobes that mediate and finally become the final arbiters of what we end up doing, that are uh, functioning in an abnormal way in pedophiles. So that there is something, uh, not probably hereditary isn't quite the right word, that there's something that they're born uh, differently, that doesn't mean that they would necessarily, if they had kids, that the children would be at risk for the same uh, condition, but there's something in the wiring as they're born for maybe because of some peculiarity in what goes on during the mother's pregnancy, whatever, uh, that, mm -hmm. can, that makes them uh, have the tendency to uh, cross-dressing and pedophilia. Uh, so therefore, yep. it's not something because, it isn't just because they were exposed to peculiarities in the home, they saw peculiar sexual things going on, which is what we used to think. There's something of a, of a uh, inborn tendency that is being expressed in these men. Folks, we're speaking with Dr. Michael Stone, of course. Uh, you're going to recognize the name, the face. Discovery Channel's Most Evil. He was the host for that show. And uh, I think it's still on reruns on Discovery Channel, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. It is. That's wonderful. Uh, it was a really informative show uh, from a clinical standpoint and from uh, all standpoints as well. His book is called Anatomy of Evil. Easy way to get it and all the information about today's show. www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book cover. We'll take you right to a place where you can order this book online. I want to warn you again, uh, every time we take a break, I will be saying uh, basically the same thing. That is, we're discussing a very heavy subject tonight, and that is the subject of serial killers. In particular, we're discussing Paul Bernardo, Carla Homolka, and of course, Russell Williams, and their makeup, and their indescribable, I don't I think we can find words to describe what they've, what they've done. Um, you may want to send the little ones off to bed at the very least or perhaps in another room and if you are so disturbed by graphic images and graphic content yourself you may want to uh, just skip this particular show let's go back to Dr. Stone Dr. Stone can we continue and go into what uh, I guess a specific like what would what would cause Russell Williams to cross that line between we know he broke into young girls rooms and he would masturbate on the bed he would grab their panties and masturbate and take pictures of himself what would what would happen inside of him to make him transgress, transgress, transgress I'll get that word out yet that line to murder 
Well, that's uh, one of the, that, that's the $64,000 question mm. about Williams, really, because he, he held himself together uh, out, outwardly so well for so long. But here's the thing, he had some peculiarities which uh, I think uh, probably be, bespeak some kind of constitutional, and by that I mean either uh, genetic or, con or during the nine months of pregnancy, something that he came uh, out into the world with that his younger brother Harvey did not come into the world with because don't forget, they both uh, were raised in this rather odd family. I'll, I'll maybe say something about that in a moment. But the, the younger brother is a doctor, and as far as we know, very well-functioning guy. So Russell was this extremely tightly wound, rigid, meticulous guy that was, uh, uh, couldn't really make friends easily with anybody. He didn't talk much about himself to anyone. Nobody really got to know him, even though he had superficial acquaintances. He, didn't marry, he was married at 28 to a woman that was older, I think by six years, and they made a pact at the beginning, not to have children. I don't. <clears throat> so he lived in that way uh, for a number of years. I think something may have happened uh, with the marriage. Something may have happened. Uh, another thing that, interestingly, uh, may count for for something and have some explanatory value. He and his wife had a cat called uh, Curio for 18 years. Pretty long time for a cat to survive. But that cat died in 2007, and people say that, or was it 2008, I think, 2000, the only time uh, Williams cried that anyone could remember. Uh, then that may account for something, that a, a, a kind of uh, desperation or a feeling lost in, in that way. Another thing about him that I think is, is important, his mother was apparently stunningly beautiful, but and not a very warm woman, an English woman, quite um, distant and cold. And uh, as you probably are aware, the, the, uh, the way that he uh, and his brother were raised was very odd indeed. The father, he was the father and uh, the other man that he worked with in nuclear science, these were highly uh, trained and intellectual people, uh, the father had an affair with a particular woman who was the wife of his colleague. And th that led to divorce. And at that point, he married that woman, Sapka. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Williams's mother then married uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Jerry Sapka. And for a number of years, uh, Russell and his brother were named Sapka rather than Williams. Later, he went back and took his old name back. So that uh, he was raised by the mother and a stepfather uh, with the name Sofka for a while, and then uh, Jerry and, uh, and, and the mom, and, and then the, the uh, other woman uh, and Ralph, the, the father of, of Williams, they raised the three kids of that woman. So there was this cross, this uh, ex going, this cross uh, family business, and that must have had some impact, but again, it's an impact on, uh, on Russell that was not so apparent in the life of his younger brother. So we can't say that, oh, because that happened, that made him what he is. No, it, it was a stress, but there had to be other, other things from a biological sort, uh, that's why I use the word genetic and constitutional, uh, that were also not right, uh, that made him vulnerable as he crosses the turn of 40, like a midlife crisis where suddenly uh, he lose, he's no longer able to uh, keep from doing certain things that he always wanted to do, and he begins to uh, break into the 84, as I recall, homes of uh, girls and, and young women when they were not there. In other words, his initial crimes were break-ins when nobody was there to be heard and stealing mountains of, of lingerie. I mean, really <laughs> serious quantities of panties and brassieres and whatnot. Uh, before he began to finally rape, uh, which I think corresponds with the time after the cat died, but I could be off a little bit on that. And then finally, the last two murders. But the murders were uh, very prolonged affairs where there's, uh, in one case, uh, pretty much a whole day of torture and, and raping uh, uh, eight or nine times the same woman over a 24-hour period uh, and filming the whole damn thing. 
uh, before he finally dispatches her. And of course, it's obvious when you've begun to do that, you have to kill the person because otherwise she's going to turn, uh, she's going to go to the police station and your career is going to be over. So, now, even sir, though they I'm mercy, s- yeah. sorry to interrupt, sir, would that be premeditated, all that torture and everything? Would he have planned that whole day out? knowing the full full well the consequence of his actions would have to result in her demise, her murder? I'd say so, yes, because he dragged in all those photographic equipment with special lighting and fancy cameras and so on, so you, you can't do that on the spur of the moment. So he knew what he was going to do, and he treasured these things in the same way that uh, BTK, Dennis Rader in Kansas City, uh, would also uh, make... Uh, tapes and whatnot of some of the things he did. A number of these guys make videotapes and some of them or, or just audio tapes. So he knew what he was about to do. And as I say, once you uh, begin to use a, a knife or, or begin to, to throttle a, a, a potential victim uh, and you rape that person, you know you have to kill them. Uh, I've been down that line with a number of, of uh, killers that I've interviewed where I, I said, well, of course, once one man, for example, castrated alive with a with a knife in adolescent so I, and once I said once you touch that groin area with a knife you knew you had to kill him because otherwise he would turn uh, state's evidence against you and your career would be over who was and that he, sir uh, that was uh, Fent- a man by the name of uh, Fentress Alan Fentress now sir uh, also why would they take video is that some sort of trophy or is that some sort of validation uh, that they could look at after for their acts. Both. Really? Yeah. Because don't forget, you, you make a video, uh, now you've got a very special video that nobody else has that you can uh, enjoy that scene, if you're morbid enough to enjoy that sort of thing, over and over again. Uh, so, sure, that that is uh, part of the purpose of, of doing all that. But also by keeping that and taking those videos, would he not run the risk of being caught? And therefore, if I extrapolate from that, did he want to be caught and stopped? Or am I going way off in a wrong direction? Pretty layman, aren't I? <laughs> well, uh, people often say uh, when one of these uh, serial killers is caught, well, he must have wanted to be caught. I think that's usually a mistake. Uh, we like to think that as though uh, they are therefore had no real intention of maintaining that career year in and year out. But I think the the smart money is on that they did not want to be caught and that they're caught only by uh, the massive efforts on the part of the of the police. Don't forget uh, Gary Ridgway, the Green River killer in Oregon, in, in Washington State, excuse me, he was doing his killing and strangling of prostitutes for 18 years. And he was not a bright person like uh, Williams. Williams, I'm assuming, has a high IQ. Uh, Gary had an IQ of 82. Uh, And it's not because he was so clever and smart. It was just that he, when you you kill strangers, first of all, it's harder to catch the person because there's no connection between the person, uh, you know, the victim and the the killer. But Gary uh, kept it going, as did uh, BTK, for 18 years each. Uh, Williams, I'm sure he would have kept going, kept going, uh, until finally uh, every little bit of clue and, and uh, would have been amassed and, and finally they caught him. They, 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 because he uh, did his crimes within a small radius, as you know, two, uh, two towns, uh, they had a uh, barricades at the roads and everybody that had a certain car that had a certain tire track uh, was looked at and finally that's how he was caught. So that, but it took a lot of clever police work uh, to do that. Modern, uh, you know, criminal investigative uh, techniques were utilized in order to hasten the process of catching him. Folks, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, you're probably riveted to your seat as I am tonight. We're discussing a very heavy subject, though. I've got to warn you: if there are little ones around, send them off to bed. If you're just joining us, because we're talking about serial killers tonight. And uh, very graphic content, very graphic uh, images as well. We're speaking with Dr. Michael Stone, of course. You will recognize that name and that face from Discovery Channel's Most Evil, uh, which was a show, of course, about serial killers. 
easy way to get his book, which is called um, Anatomy of Evil. You can go just go to nightfrightshow.com, nightfrightshow, and it's right here, dot com, and just click on tonight's uh, guest book cover, and that'll take you right to a place where you can order it from the comfort of your own home. As I said at the outset, we're a stone's throw, folks, from the Kingston Penitentiary. Um, no pun <laughs> oh, no pun intended. Sorry, I just realized that. He's got a great sense of humor. Go figure. He's a psychiatrist. He's got a great sense of humor. And he deals with serial killers. Hello, you got to have a great, you know, as a defensive mechanism, I guess, because you're That's dealing right. with, with the most unhuman of humans. And yet, I think the thing that perplexes me, it's, it's when I think of a Hitler uh, or somebody like that. Here's a guy with a heart. And I don't mean in a um, in a metaphor or a symbolic way, but he breathes, he lives and breathes just like you and I do. Where does the switch get flipped to create these these guys? We're going to talk about Paul Bernardo now, folks. Uh, as I said before, be prudent about who's listening uh, right now. Um, I hail from Montreal, as most of you know. And when I was in a coffee shop in Montreal, Carla Homolka had just been released. And I was lined up in a big line, and uh, uh, finally there was a woman in front of me, a heavy woman and uh, short hair and not all that attractive. Uh, when she left, uh, somebody came up to me from behind me and said, that was Carla Homolka. And I was expecting if I ever ran into a serial killer or something, and this goes back to what I just said before, folks, about them being as human and as unassuming as we are. Uh, I always felt that I would sense an aura of evil around them or something, I don't know, a paranormal, if, for lack of a better word. But this is not the case. And, sir, this is why I think what you do is a must. Um, we've got to understand so we can figure out how to best treat these folks. And can we talk a little bit about uh, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka? They're called the Barbie killers. Go for Canon Barbie killers. Well, the interesting thing about uh, Paul Bernardo, of course, is he was a year younger than Williams. So Williams was born in... 63 and uh, Paul Bernardo in 64 and they went I guess to the same college for a while um, but there's a difference between Williams uh, and uh, Bernardo in, in one particular sense. Can I just uh, stop you there sir? Is there any evidence that has come to you that they could have been friends? And I'm going to ask you another stretch. Could they have been lovers while in college? I don't think they were lovers. Uh, I don't think that uh, Williams uh, lived as a gay person uh, at, at that part of his life, or even at this part of his life, uh, and, you know, there are there are transvestites who are distinctly uh, heterosexually oriented. I think Williams is in that camp, and there are some other ones that I have looked at uh, among the serial killers as well, who are decidedly gay, like Joseph Duncan in Idaho, and so on. But uh, they may have crossed paths. I don't know that they knew each uh, other, let alone that they had any in, in, uh, any influence on one another. Fair enough. Sorry but, to interrupt you, sir. Yeah, but Paul, uh, unlike uh, William, Paul was a poster child for a psychopath. What do I mean by psychopath? Uh, the person who is callous, unemotional, uh, incapable of feeling remorse, uh, glib, superficially charming, uh, manipulative, able to lie very easily, uh, and often um, doing uh, juvenile delinquent type things in their younger days. Uh, but the but the main the essence of it is the callousness and the lack of empathy for other people uh, and the lack of remorse. Now Williams was a more conventionally put together person than that. I don't think it would be fair to consider uh, Williams a psychopath, which makes him unusual in the ranks of serial killers. The vast majority of whom do meet criteria for psychopathy, as the famous psychologist out in Vancouver, Robert Hare. Uh, has um, developed a scale for evaluating. So Bernardo, now, but one thing that they have in common, <clears throat> and I was going to mention this uh, in, in connection with Williams, uh, would the, you, why would you rape and kill if, just because you were transvestite? Well, you wouldn't. Uh, the, the, out of a thousand transvestites, probably only one or two are going to be violent. So the ones who do the things that he did have to have a submerged hatred, which then, uh, in William's case, began to come to the surface 
in his mid-40s. Uh, and I think it's because of the coldness and the perhaps the, the distance, emotional distance of the mother uh, that it played a role. And because the acts of Williams toward the end were ones of hating women. Uh, he's heterosexual, but he hates, the, these are misogynistic acts of, of humiliating and degrading women. Now, Paul yet, Bernard... I'm sorry, sir, but yet, sir, he dressed as a woman. As if he, he wanted to be a woman. So is that self-hate then? No, I think, well, yes, he may have had, uh, I wouldn't say the self-hatred uh, was uh, on the same page as the dressing like a woman. I think there's two things going on, probably. The identification with the unavailable mother woman. Don't forget, he married a, a woman a good bit older, decided never to have children. So I think there was a... Uh, a part of the of that uh, attachment that had to do with recreating the idea of the lost mother, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, he's also nurturing this uh, chronic uh, anger and hatred of his own mother, which then comes out symbolically in the destruction of these uh, of these women. And with Bernardo, there's a parallel because Paul Bernardo had a rather odd. Uh, unpleasant, uh, uh, not even a pretty woman like Williams' mother. And when he was 16 or 17, thereabouts, uh, she told him, uh, Paul, that his real father is not the guy she was married to and by whom she had two other children, but rather some man he never knew. Uh, and that was, he was very crestfallen. But he had already begun to be uh, a delinquent, a, a, a wheeler dealer, uh, person that was also uh, very cruel to women, uh, if he was very jealous, he would uh, hurt women that uh, displeased him in any way. So he was already uh, on his way you know, to um, the, the kinds of acts that we uh, <clears throat> know that he later committed uh, with, with Carla, etc. But So he was a bad apple, uh, much more readily detectable than was ever the case with Williams at the same age. Williams, during those years, was a trumpet-playing loner who didn't have very many friends, but he was a very good military man and rose to high rank. Paul was always somebody you know, who was uh, out to scam people, take advantage, uh, sell people uh, stuff that, you know, <laughs> for huge profit, uh, get rich schemes and so on. And he was, <clears throat> as I say, very cruel uh, to the women that uh, he came in contact with. Was he a manipulator, sir? Absolutely. Completely. Uh. Folks, yes. we're talking about a heavy subject tonight. We're talking about uh, serial killers. Uh, you know, not a stone's throw from here is the Kingston Penitentiary. I said it again that because uh, <laughs> we're speaking with Dr. <laughs> Michael Stone. And uh, you, I'm sure you've all recognized that face from Discovery Channel's Most Evil. Um, he's got a great book out. It's called Anatomy of Evil, where he breaks down Ted Bundy, um, Charles Manson, I'm trying to think of some others off the top of my head, some of the names that we've talked about tonight uh, in his book. He also has 22 levels of evil, if you will, gradations of evil, and we're going to be talking about that soon. Easy way to get his book and information on our guest, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book cover once you're there. That'll take you right to a place we can order it from the comfort of your own home and do settle in tonight because it is stormy out there. I'm looking at the wind whipping across Lake Ontario right now and the rain is streaming down hitting the window. I don't know if you can hear it in the mic or not. Uh, creepy night, folks. Very, very creepy night. It's a good night to settle in and learn a little bit uh, about serial killers tonight. Dr. Stone... Were these two meant to meet Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo? Uh, you know, you, you think of, ah, oh, geez, you know, they say opposites attract, but I don't think so in this case. It sounds like they were one half of the same evil gene. Well, uh, Carla was uh, uh, interesting in, in this way. I think they were destined for one another, um, but she is one of these very pliable women. When she was already 17 years old, she was down in America for a while and meeting some guy who uh, allowed, and she allowed him to uh, practice bondage on her and a lot of peculiar uh, sexual practices uh, so that she was one of these 
uh, I, I, uh, women, you know, who could be easily manipulated, and of course Paul was a master manipulator, uh, when they got together, uh, he was very jealous and angry that she had had sex before they uh, knew each other. So that was one of the reasons why he insisted that she let him uh, have sex with her younger sister Tammy, as if, well, that would make up for uh, him uh, not having uh, a experience with her as a virgin. Now he's got a doing her sister as a virgin. So by that time, Carla uh, was working as a veterinary assistant and had some familiarity with the kinds of um, um, drugs you would use you know, to anesthetize animals. And so she was actually willing to, and here's the evil part, she was willing to let Paul uh, and uh, 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 rape her younger sister, 15-year-old sister, there's pedophilia again, uh, with her supplying the halothane and halcyon to get the girl unconscious. Uh, and that's, uh, that's really sick. <laughs> <laughs> and you laugh. Uh, <laughs> but it's the only the, way to the do girl, it, though. And the, the idea was not to kill her. No, uh, just to rape her. Uh, but she died because she uh, <clears throat> vomited and breathed, or I should say breathed back, yes, some of the vomitous context, and then died uh, with her uh, lung uh, filling up you know, with the vomitous. And so that, that was a, a mistake. They didn't anticipate that. However... Shortly thereafter, uh, they killed their first woman together, and then the next year in 91 killed a second one. Uh, and it was after that that, uh, that they were caught. But uh, Carla herself uh, was this uh, tool that he could do anything with, even though she had these, she was willing you know, to play him along and go along with him, which is the evil part of her. Paul is the major evil. She's a kind of uh, minor evil. Uh, and he would uh, make her uh, have sex with lesbians and take pictures and take videos so that he could use that as blackmail so that if she were to leave him, he could then show the world these videos and therefore that would prevent her from uh, leaving the relationship, okay? Uh, some, then one time uh, she had a pet iguana. Don't ask me why she had a pet iguana, but she had a pet iguana. <laughs> and the, the little iguana bit uh, Paul on the finger. So he got very angry, and he made her cook the uh, iguana, and then he ate her pet iguana. So no more Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, and he blackened her eyes at one point, and she finally got to the point where she was so brutalized that she realized that she might as well turn state's evidence and turn him in <clears throat> because uh, her life was uh, becoming unbearable uh, even while she was with him. So that's how... He got caught, and because, and that's how she got a lenient sentence of two 12-year concurrent sentences. Uh, and I remember doing a TV program in Ontario uh, the day before she was to be released, and they asked me, uh, the interviewer asked me, well, do, you, do I, I think that she would pose some risk to society uh, when she's released? I said, well, she, the only way I could picture her being a dangerous person. I don't think she would do the kinds of things she did on her own, because women don't usually do that sort of stuff. But if they team up with a manipulator like that, some of them uh, who lack any kind of strong moral center and ego may be uh, arm twisted into doing these things. So I said she is at risk to want to affiliate with a killer. Well, the next day, I see the National Post, is that your big uh, yes, uh, newspaper? Yes, sir. It said uh, she was about to marry a killer that she met in the prison library. So there you are. That's right. Uh, and uh, uh, do you think she should... She has a baby now, by the way, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of. Now, my concern is, you know, the baby grows up, and, and here's the scenario. The kid's going to be around 12 or 14 and go, Mom, what did you do when you were a teenager or when you were a young person? And what does the mom answer? What does Carla Homoka say? Well, I killed your aunt. And uh, it's just the whole scenario when I think of her out there with an actual human being responsible for that human being is so bizarre. Uh, it is. It's, it's yes. surreal. It's surreal. Yep. And yet there it is. And, uh, you know, I have to take a shot at the Canadian justice system for even allowing such a, a beast out. 
um, she may be a victim, but she certainly went along with it, and I don't think that she should be she should be free. I mean, if she hooks up, like you said, with another one of these predators, and the chances are she will. God knows what we've unleashed upon a society. Paul Bernardo's behind bars right now, and as I point, I'm pointing to the <laughs> Kingston <laughs> Penitentiary, folks, because we broadcast the stones for uh, a stones throw from there. Um, I should say, not far from there. How's that? That's better. Um, <laughs> Apparently, he's in a four by eight cell. He spends 23 hours a day there. Um, what do we do with a Russell Williams? We don't want to let them out, obviously. What do we do with a Paul Bernardo? We don't have the pe- death penalty here in Canada, and I agree with that. But at the same token, is there any chance that these two could be actually. Uh, rehabilitated i guess uh become helpful to society instead of a burden on society we both know they're highly intelligent i think you would have a better chance of winning the lottery twice (laughs) than uh, (laughs) having either of them rehabilitated i don't because don't forget uh they have a lot of blood on their hands uh so it's very different If you had, uh, let's say, um, begun to work with a youngster, and I have worked with with several, who have very uh, morbid and grotesque rape fantasies, but they haven't laid a hand on anybody. Now, there are a number of young uh, 18-year-old, 20-year-old young men who have those kinds of fantasies. Uh, If you work with them, and there was one that uh, I remember was hospitalized because he had these very terrible fantasies and people were worried about him and probably rightly so, although he had never uh, touched an improper hand on anybody. Uh, It was during the time that back in the early 90s when Jeffrey Dahmer had been caught uh, and we hospitalized him and we kept him in the hospital. In those days you kept people in in, in the hospital of Columbia much longer than we tend to do now. We kept him for almost three years. At first the uh, girls on the unit were spooked, and they referred to him as Little Jeffrey because of these very morbid fantasies of wanting to hurt women. Uh, but over time, he was treated, and he was allowed then to uh, leave the hospital. He got a room with another uh, young man who had left the hospital, and it's been about 25 years, and uh, he has not done any crimes. Now, he was somebody who had a very awful uh, background. His uh, his father was a gymnast, and the father uh, would taunt him. He was a very shy fellow, and the father said, "Oh, I'll, I'll fix you up with uh, you know some nice looking little girl, and I'll bring her over here, and and you can you know make out with her, have sex, whatever." When the when he would bring the girl home, the father himself would have uh, sex with the girl, and the boy would be left either watching or listening in the next room. So. And the mother was a very cold, rejecting woman who had to pretty much abandon the family. So he had a very bad uh, early life. But as I say, because uh, his uh, very uh, violent fantasies were caught uh, in a state before, before he had begun to act out on them, uh, he was salvageable. Once you have done the kinds of things that Russell Williams has done, or Paul Bernardo, or even Karen Hamalka for that matter, have participated in, I don't think that the idea of uh, cure or rehabilitation is possible to say nothing of the fact that society has a right to feel protected from people who have that potential. Uh, You know, we don't have uh, God handing us a piece of email saying, well, uh, I give you a promise, uh, sign God, that uh, Russell or Paul from this point forward, it's not going to do anything bad, so hey, you you have my word. God doesn't give us those messages. So, I think (laughs) society has a right to be protected against people who have a track record, particularly when they have the psychological attributes of the psychopath where they don't have the feeling of guilt and remorse and feeling bad about what they did, as is the case with Paul Bernardo, where why in heaven's name would you trust such a person? 
Precisely. And folks, we're speaking with Dr. Michael Stone tonight. You're going to recognize the face, of course, and the name. Uh, Discovery Channel's Most Evil. Uh, also, he's got uh, all kinds of great books out. He teaches psychiatry at Columbia, the book that we're talking about tonight. Um, Anatomy of Evil, easy way to get it as always, www.nightfrightshow.com. As I go along here, it could be this way, actually. Um, just click on the book cover once you're there. That'll take you right to a place where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. And tonight, as I say, is a great night to do that. As I look out over Lake Ontario, the storm is just raging out there. Sir, I want to jump to the 22 gradations of evil scale. And perhaps you can tell us where Carla Homolka, Paul Bernardo, and of course, Russell Williams fits on the scale. And folks, you can get this scale Easy way to get it is in his book, Anatomy of Evil. Uh, so this is worth the price of gold, let me tell you. Um, but before we do that, I want to ask you a, a serious question here. Now, um, with all these guys, is it gender specific? Uh, is there something in the male, as I point to myself, because I'm a male, is there something in our makeup that makes us, uh, I won't say preconditioned to become serial killers or violence of this sort uh, more over than women as you said it's mostly males that, that uh, is it something in our genetic makeup sure our physiology uh, yes it's a think of, think of violence uh, and in men who uh, kill others and so on uh, men tend to kill at a rate about uh, eight times that of, of women I didn't know but th think of our function in the state of nature, think of it in the in the African savanna from which we emerged about 50,000 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, uh, and began to branch out into the four corners of the world. Uh, we lived in little bitty tribes of 150 people where our brains are still wired to deal with small numbers of people that we know personally and so on. And let's say you're living in a tribe of 150 people uh, in a particular spot, and maybe two miles down the road, there's another tribe with perhaps 300 or 250 people, and they get their eyes on some of the stuff you have. Well, they can have their sons go over and uh, <clears throat> take their bows and arrows and uh, conquer your tribe. Unless, of course, you manage to be fruitful and multiply and get yourself up to a larger number, and you can take their stuff. So, that, uh, But it's the men who guard the perimeter. We always have guarded the perimeter. We have male soldiers in the main. The women are in the center of this circle, this little tribe, uh, taking care of the kitties and cooking the uh, stews that the men, when they bring home the bisons or whatever they have killed in the hunt. So that's how, uh, our, that's how we live. And our brains have not differed a heck of a lot from those times, even though our society now is infinitely more complex than it was in, in the uh, eastern part of Africa 50,000 years ago. So men guard the perimeter, men are the ones who have the capacity for violence uh, in order to safeguard the group that they belong to. Now, that's, so we're wired for that. Now, under certain circumstances, that wiring... Can I just interrupt you, sir? You say we're wired for that. Is that hardwired or is it behavioral? And it's hardwired. And then under certain circumstances, uh, we can uh, mobilize ourselves along those lines. Now, obviously, most people go there. That we also are wired for cooperation within the group. We, we're not only wired for bad things. We're also wired for good things, for, getting, for cooperating, uh, for uh, preserving uh, sympathy, duties, uh, uh, and things of that sort, uh, fairness and, and whatnot. We're wired for that, too. But we have the capacity under certain circumstances uh, to... Uh, go toward the violent solutions for things, and obviously some men are more uh, wired for that, if you will, the, the psychopath particularly, because he, is, he, doesn't, he doesn't have the safeguard of empathy and feeling bad for somebody like a little kid that's crying or, or a woman that's, that's feeling upset, uh, which would ordinarily turn off a man's desire to hurt that person. If you lack that piece, and, and there's... Uh, uh, bits of the brain, as I was mentioning earlier, that if they are not functioning properly uh, because the uh, emotional centers of the brain are not developed perfectly or the, there's interruptions in certain circuitry, which we know is the case with 
uh, some antisocial and psychopathic men, then those men are predisposed, given some life circumstances, including adverse early circumstances, to go in the direction of using violent solutions rather than nonviolent solutions. That clears that up, sir. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, geez, you know, that's, that's really revealing. Folks, Dr. Michael Stone, we've only got, actually, I look at the clock, we've only got about a minute and a half, two minutes left. Can we just jump to that gradation, 22 levels, gradation of evil scale, sir, and perhaps we can plug in, let's say, Carla Homoka to start off with. Uh, in the 22 levels, where would she fit in? Well, I feel, I feel that uh, she's a, um, a less drastic example of 16 multiple vicious acts and... Uh, not including murder. Some of them have done um, repetitive rapes, but they haven't murdered anybody. And so I, I divide my 16 into two groups, the ones who murdered and the ones who didn't. Uh, once you get into serial sexual homicide, uh, then you're at 17 or higher. The 17s are the ones who don't, prolong, don't subject their victims to prolonged torture, uh, maybe like Ted Bundy. Uh, then you have some like Jerry Budos in Oregon who did uh, subject him to fairly prolonged torture, 18, and then I, my maximum number 22 for men that really went after it uh, to the max and built torture chambers and subject their victims to days, weeks uh, of torture like David Parker Ray uh, in New Mexico or, or Leonard Lake in, in California. And because of the rather prolonged torture of the last two victims of Williams, um, he would at least be 18, uh, and, and because those women suffered extraordinarily, especially the last one, uh, maybe even to the level of 22, because she knew during that whole 24 hours of being raped and, and hit and so on, strangled, uh, that, that she was going to die, that he couldn't possibly let her go because he would be caught immediately by her testimony. So she knew, uh, she had that knowledge 24 hours that she was about to die. That's really just excruciating. I can't even, you know. Paul Bernardo, where, where would he fit on the scale? We've only got about 30 seconds, sir. Uh, and another 22 because the, oh, yeah. uh, of the torture of the, of the women. Uh, so they're at, but uh, as you begin to look at large numbers of these people, you, I, as I've often said in, in the <clears throat> interviews of this sort, if I had it to do over, knowing more now than I did when I created the scale, I'd make a 23 for the really prolonged torturers like Leonard Lake and, and David Parker Ray, uh, who uh, would subject their victims to more than a day, probably weeks and even months of torture, so that they're even worse than the two men that we've been focusing on this evening. You know, folks, I shake my head in disbelief because... How do you describe something like this with words? Uh, where do these people come from? We've been trying to explore that as we've been going along. We've been talking about serial killers tonight, three of the biggest right here in Canada. whoop de doo isn't that something for us to celebrate? Carla Momoka, Paul Bernardo, and, of course, Russell Williams. Russell Williams, Paul Bernardo, who's not far from where we broadcast Night Fright uh, in the Kingston Penitentiary. We've been speaking with Dr. Michael Stone tonight. Easy way to get his book, Anatomy of Evil, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book cover. We'll take you right to a place where you can order the book online. I want to thank Dr. Stone. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. See you next time. Listening to Night Fright and your host, Brent Holland. The time is now. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio.